Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support our channel, please subscribe. The Hidden and Mysterious First Marriage of Anne Boleyn When Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII married, it divided England in two. Many across the country were outraged and disgusted with the way the notorious Tudor king treated his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who had been banished from royal court and was practically held a prisoner of her former husband. There was even a rebellion and a group of women who tried to seize Anne Boleyn and take her as a prisoner. Anne, it's argued, is the most important consort in English history. And with the marriage, the king then began to continue his changes to church, which upset many. But there was a secret scandal linked to Anne, and it related to rumours at court that she had been betrothed to another man earlier, and may have even got married before she tied the knot with Henry VIII. But what is the story behind this? Anne spent much of her adolescence at the French court and impressed many people there. She learnt the game of courtly love and how to capture a lover and possible husband. But then she returned home to England in 1522. She was the daughter of an ambitious courtier and the niece of the Duke of Norfolk. Her father and uncle planned that she would marry a man who would secure the finances of the Boleyn family and more power for them. They likely never predicted that one day she would marry the King of England whose eye was captured by Anne very quickly. She captivated court and her wit and beauty quickly made the king desperate to make her his mistress. But there was a problem. Firstly, Anne would not take to the king's bed until she became his queen, and her sister had also been a mistress of the Tudor monarch, and she wanted the problem with Catherine of Aragon sorting. Anne did not want to be a mistress, she wanted to be a queen. The king had many mistresses, but only one queen. But there was another issue, as whilst at court she was courted by Henry Percy, the son of the Earl of Northumberland. It was said of Anne at court that she was the perfect woman courtier, her carriage was graceful and her French clothes were very pleasing and stylish. She danced with ease and had a pleasant singing voice, playing the lute and several other musical instruments well, and spoke French fluently, a remarkable, intelligent, quick-witted and young noblewoman that first drew people into conversation with her, and then amused and entertained them. In short, her energy and vitality made her the centre of attention in any social gathering. But who was this Henry Percy, the man she began to fall in love with? He was the eldest son of Henry Percy, the fifth Earl of Northumberland, and whilst he was young, he had been sent to serve as a page in the household of Cardinal Wolsey. He was taught here how to be an aristocrat and was knighted in 1519 and had been planned to have been betrothed in 1516 to Mary Talbot, the daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury. But he fell in love with Anne Boleyn, who was just a young girl at court, and Percy then became betrothed to Anne around the spring of 1523, whilst he was still a page to Wolsey. When he heard the news, Wolsey was furious and he bellowed at him in front of his household as permission for the marriage had not been sought from his father or the king. It was claimed at the time that the king had already shown interest in Anne at this point, and this is what drove Wolsey's angry reaction. It was clear Henry planned to marry Anne, but there were a number of obstacles, including James Butler, the ninth Earl of Ormond, who was also a page at Wolsey's household, but he had a big dispute with Sir Thomas Boleyn, Anne's father, over lands. Also, Percy's father refused to allow the match as he believed that Anne had too low of a standing for his son, as he believed she was only the daughter of a knight, and therefore not high enough rank for his son, or heir to the Northumberland estates and title. With this, his father was furious and then scolded him, saying, Thou hast always been a proud, presumptuous and unthrifty waster. An account of the proceedings was written by George Cavendish, one of Cardinal Wolsey's gentleman ushers. It was said, At this time Lord Percy, the son and heir of the Earl of Northumberland, was aide and secretary to Wolsey, the Lord Cardinal. And whenever the Lord Cardinal happened to be at court, Lord Percy would pass the time in the Queen's quarters, where he would dally with the ladies-in-waiting. Of these, he was most familiar with Mistress Anne Boleyn, to such an extent that a secret love grew up between them, and they pledged that, in time, they intended to wed. When knowledge of this reached the king's ears, he was greatly distraught. Realising that he could no longer hide his secret love, he revealed all to the Lord Cardinal and discussed with him ways of sundering the couple's engagement to each other. 
When the Lord Cardinal had left the court and returned to Westminster, he remembered Henry's request and summoned Lord Percy to his presence, saying in front of us his servants, I am amazed at your foolishness in getting entangled, even engaged to this silly girl at court, I mean Anne Boleyn. Have you not considered your position? After the death of your noble father, you stand to inherit one of the greatest earldoms in the country. It would thus have been more proper if you had sought the consent of your father in this affair, and to have made his highness the king privy to it, requesting his royal blessing. Had you done so, he would not only have welcomed your request, but would, I can assure you, have promoted you to a position more suited to your noble estate, and thence you might have gained the king's favour by your conduct and wise counsel, and thus risen further, still in his estimation. But look at what you have done by your thoughtlessness. You have not only offended your father, but also your sovereign, and pledged yourself to someone whom neither would agree to be suitable. And do not doubt that I shall send for your father, and when he comes he will break off this engagement or disinherit you forever. The king himself will make a complaint to your father, and demand no less an action than I have suggested. Indeed, I happen to know that the king has already promised this lady to someone else, and that though she is not yet aware of it, the arrangements are already far advanced. The king, however, being a man of great prudence and diplomacy, is confident that, once she is aware of the situation, she will agree to the union gladly. Sir, said Lord Percy, weeping, I knew nothing of the king's involvement in all this, and I am sorry to have incurred his displeasure. I consider myself to be of sufficient age and in good enough situation to be able to take a wife of my own choosing, and never doubted that my father would have accepted my decision. And though she is just a simple maid, and her father is only a knight, yet she is of very noble descent. On her mother's side she has Norfolk blood, and on her father's side she is a direct descendant of the Earl of Ormond. Why then, sir, should I query the suitability of the match when her pedigree is of equal worth to mine? Thus I humbly beg you favour in this matter, and ask you to beg the king to be benevolent concerning this issue of my engagement, which I cannot deny, still less break it off. See, gentlemen, said the Lord Cardinal to us, what nonsense is there in this wilfully boy's head? I thought that when you heard me explain the king's involvement in this business, you would have relented in your suits and have submitted yourself to the king's will, allowing his highness to decide on the matter of he thinks fit. Sir, and so would I, said Lord Percy, but in this matter I have gone so far that I am no longer able to renounce my commitment in full conscience. What, said the Cardinal, do you think that the King and I do not know what to do in such a serious matter as this? One thing's for sure, I can see no point in you making any further pleas in this case. Very well, said Lord Percy, if it please you, I will submit myself completely to the King's will in this matter and will release my conscience from this heavy burden of the engagement. So be it then, said the Cardinal. I will send for your father in the north, and he, the King and I, will take whatever measure for the annulment of this hasty folly the King thinks necessary. And in the meantime, I order you, and in the King's name command you, not to see her again if you intend to avoid this full wrath of His Majesty. Having said this, he got up and went off to his study. Then the Earl of Northumberland was sent for, who, learning of the request of being at the King's command, made great speed to court. His first port of call after leaving the North was to Lord Cardinal, by whom he was briefed about the cause of his hasty summons, and with whom he spent a considerable time in secret discussion. After their long talk, the Cardinal ordered some wine, and after they had drunk together, the meeting broke up and the Earl left. As he was leaving, he sat down on a bench that the servants used and called his son Lord Percy to him, saying in our presence, Son, you have always been a proud, presumptuous, headstrong wastrel, and you have so proved yourself once more. What possible joy, comfort, pleasure or solace could I ever receive from you, who have so misconducted yourself without discretion and in such secrecy? With no regard for your own father, nor for your sovereign, to whom all honest and loyal subjects give faithful and humble obedience, nor even for your own noble estate, you have ill-advisedly become engaged to this girl, and thereby incurred the king's displeasure, an action intolerable in any of his subjects. If it wasn't for the wisdom of the king and his benevolence towards your empty-heartedness and willful stupidity, 
His wrath would have been sufficient to cast me and all my family for generations to come in abject poverty and desolation. But by the supreme goodness of his grace and the worthy Lord Cardinal, I have been excused your transgression. They have decidedly to pity your stupidity rather than blame it, and have presented me with a command concerning you and your future conduct. I pray to God that this may serve as a sufficient warning to you to conduct yourself with more care hereafter, for I can assure you that, if you do not amend your ways, you will be the last Earl of Northumberland if I have anything to do with it. You do nothing but waste and consume everything that all of your ancestors have built up and cherished with great honour. But in the name of the good and gracious King, I intend, God willing, see to arrange my succession that you will benefit from it but little. For I have no intention, I can assure you, of making you my heir. I have, after all, praise be to God, a wide choices of sons who will, I am sure, prove themselves worthy than you and able to conduct themselves as true nobles should. And from these I will choose the best as my successor. Now, gentlemen, he said to his servants, it may so happen that when I am dead, you will see these things that I have spoken of to my son prove to be the case. Yet in the meantime, I would be grateful if you could be his friends and tell him when he strays from the path or is at fault. And with that, he took his leave of us and said to his son, go on your way and serve the Lord Cardinal, your master, and make sure you carry out your duty. And thus he departed and went down through the hall and out onto his barge. Following the scandal with Anne Boleyn, Henry Percy was then hastily and quickly married to Lady Mary Talbot, the daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury. By early 1525, the marriage lasted four years, and then this relationship broke down as it was claimed by Percy that his wife was spying on him for the Earl of Norfolk, and with this her father was worried that Henry Percy was abusing her and had planned to poison her. Mary later then accused her husband of a pre-contract with Anne Boleyn, and this was a betrothal with legal standing, and with this could have caused chaos for the English king, Henry VIII. An inquiry was ordered and Percy denied on the oath that he had a legal betrothal to Anne, as he probably knew that admitting that he did would lead to him losing his head, as it would possibly have made Henry VIII's marriage to Anne illegitimate and invalid, and also would make his daughter Elizabeth, the future Elizabeth I, illegitimate. But there is still much mystery which surrounds the legitimacy of Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII's marriage, and it's possible that she may have been married to Henry Percy in secret also before taking the king's bed. It was a shocking revelation, and one which would plague their marriage. Also, it's clear that Henry Percy lost out as he was very unhappily married after, in spite of his accusations and betrothal to Anne. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.